الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم وفيهم برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين After completing the book سفينة النجا in the fiqh of Imam Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i Today inshallah and for until we finish this book we will start on a explaining a poem uh, of one of the poems of one of the great scholars of the Ummah who passed away over 300 years ago. The poem was explained and uh, expanded upon uh, by his uh, outstanding and foremost students. The poem it's called itself is by Imam Abdullah ibn Alawi al-Haddad uh, and it is titled Al-Wasiyyah, also known as Al-Ba'iyyah. And it is one of his poems that he compiled, taking us step by step through the various uh, uh, um, steps that a person needs to take in his drawing nearer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is truly a beautiful, concise and very practical poem to be applied. Uh, Imam Abdullah bin Alawi al-Haddad is one of the scholars who was born in the year 1044 Hijri the 1044 Hijri. He was born uh, in, a, in a village that was then on the outskirts of, uh, of Tarim, a city in the south of Yemen, in the, um, in the area that is known as Hadramaut. Uh, the city itself was known as a city of scholars and a city of, of the pious and the righteous and any person who reads through the books of uh, Islamic geography on the chapter uh, on, on Tarim it is identified there as a city of knowledge and the city of the pious uh, and the righteous Yemen in general is a place where the Prophet Sallallahu made dua for and he Yemen and Sham may Allah alleviate their burden they alleviate the burden of the people of, of, of Sham and all of the Muslims. The Yemen and the Sham are, are specifically blessed places, as is all of the land, but the Yemen and Sham specifically are mentioned in the Ahadith. And if uh, we look into the history, we find that they are places and centers of learning from which many of the learned scholars of the Ummah have come forth. Uh, and centers where the Deen has been preserved over the ages. So he was born in the city of Tarim, which is toward in the south of Yemen and from a family that was also known and uh, for its piety and righteousness uh, they are known as the Bani Alawi the children of Alawi who resided in Tarim uh, who traced their lineage tra uh, traced their lineage back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi wa Wasallam through his grandson uh, Sayyidina Hussein radiallahu anhu wa arda and so his family was a family of piety and righteousness and the city in which he was born was also known uh, for its piety and righteousness and the knowledge therein but the imam was amongst his peers and amongst uh, his family identified and distinguished from a young age a young age to be of a person a person who was naturally inclined towards uh, attaining uh, degrees, uh, high ranks and degrees of spirituality. Uh, from the time, from the, uh, the age of about four years old, Imam Haddad contracted a disease, uh, smallpox, and he lost his eyesight as a result of that. And while he lost his eyesight, his physical eyesight, his insight, he never lost. Rather, that continued to grow. And despite his visual impairment, Imam Haddad continued to uh, interact and uh, as, as any other child would in life. And by a very young age, and prior to the age of 10, he had memorized the whole of the Qur'an. And in fact, at that young age, he had made it a habit uh, that after he would go to study his Qur'an with the teacher in the masjid after Fajr, until sunrise. After sunrise, he would leave the, the place of Qur'an and go from masjid to masjid in Tarim. And in every masjid, he would pray two rak'ahs of duha, which resulted in 200 rak'ahs of duha every morning. This is as a child. 
That's something that he that he did. By the that was the 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 the, uh, the uh, something that he did without yani, being having to force to do it or anything of that sort. He continued and he had uh, a lot of effort uh, on his part in ibadah and in seeking of knowledge to the extent that his his parents and his grandparents were concerned. Uh, his grandmother was concerned for his um, for his health that he was exerting too much effort, too much mujahada. So they asked him to slow down, to take things a little easy. So he, he took things a little easier, but he continued to pray his 200 rakahs of duha. That was the thing that he didn't leave. By the age, uh, when, by the age of 17, he, he, w he married and he began to teach uh, by that age, the age of 17 years old. He had reached a degree of knowledge whereby he was able to teach. And in those years of youth, he would go with a few friends of his. There were three or four of them who were companions in studying and seeking knowledge. They would go from teacher to teacher and study. They would, uh, they would go on the outskirts of the city, in the valleys and up on the mountains, with their books, and read their books of fiqh, revised with one another, as well as their memorization of the Qur'an. They would go and read to one another their Qur'an. And sometimes he would go by himself to spend that time in seclusion and in the seeking of knowledge. As we said, by the age of 17, he began, he began, to, began to teach uh, in, uh, in, in his city of Tarim. Um, and he continued to teach until he, uh, uh, he went for Hajj. When he came back from Hajj, he settled on the outskirts of what is now inside of that city of Tarim but then was on the outskirts of Tarim in an area that is called Al-Hawi. Um, and he settled there and he established his masjid that is still there now and his house where he lived in. And he continued to teach and write books and concern himself with the matters of da'wah calling people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through both letters and through himself moving around and by teaching those students who came uh, to him. Uh, to seek knowledge from him until he passed away in the year 1132 Hijri the 1132 Hijri this is very briefly uh, the life of Imam al-Haddad um, there is a book um, that is compiled about his biography it's called uh, the Sufi Sage of Arabia I think it's called Imam al-Haddad in his writing, as is the way in the approach of the, of the Bani Alaw in general, is they follow in the way of Imam Abu Hamid al-Ghazali in terms of their, um, their discipline outward, uh, uh, outwardly conforming to the Sharia, to the, um, to the utmost. In fact, Imam al-Haddad, and as is the case with all of the scholars of the Ummah, uh, they attain their heights and the ranks that they did only by following in the footsteps of the Prophet And the more they followed in the footsteps of the Prophet the greater they were, both in their private application, in the knowledge that they sought, and in spreading the da'wah, and shouldering the burden and the responsibility of the Prophet by conveying the da'wah. And so Imam al-Haddad, he says that towards the end of his life he grew his hair to beyond his earlobe and he said that I have there is not a sunnah of the sunnahs of the Prophet وسلم, except that I have applied in my life and there was only this one sunnah of growing the hair and this was the only sunnah that remained and now I am uh, in hope that all of the sunnahs of the Prophet وسلم, I have applied in my life. He passed away uh, after he fell ill with the sickness and the reason he fell ill, he would say that the reason he became ill was because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had disciplined him. On the night of the 22nd, 26th of Sha'ban, he went to visit the family of one of his wives with the intention of uh, Silat al-Rahim. And he said, this was a night that the Prophet used to spend in ibadah and tahajjud. And I, his intention was also ibadah, but it wasn't the ibadah that the Prophet did on that night. And he said, as a way of discipline, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala disciplined me with this illness. And he ended up passing away as a result of that illness. Uh, and, but the, the, the point being is that, he, one, he was, he was able to identify 
uh, that area that he had missed one of the sunnahs of the Prophet and one of us if we were to perhaps try to look into our lives and identify the, the sunnah that we are missing because of which uh, calamities or difficulties befall us then we would find that it's probably our whole life that is the cause of that uh, but these are people who observe their every moment, their every breath in piety and righteousness and he passed away uh, while his student, the, the one who explained the wasiyah uh, that we'll be uh, reading, the book uh, from which we will be reading Mawarid al rawi al Haniya, he was reading on him from Watta of Imam Malik and as he's reading the Watta to his teacher, his teacher passes away in the state of seeking knowledge and teaching knowledge this is narrated of many of the pious the scholars of the Ummah that on their deathbeds they would ask for the students to read on them or they would be discussing the masala of knowledge and they say that I would like to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment in the state of seeking knowledge or teaching knowledge that is the state that I would like to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in on the day of judgment and uh, no doubt that it is one of the greatest means of drawing nearer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is seeking knowledge with a proper intention uh, the, his, his student Habib Ahmad bin Zain al-Habshi uh, is uh, also was one of his main, most distinguished uh, students uh, but before we move on to, to um, Ahmad bin Zain he's the Imam al-Haddad himself he's, na he's known as Imam al-Haddad uh, his, his actual name is Abdullah bin Alawi al-Haddad and the name Al-Haddad literally means in Arabic, a blacksmith. And the reason that they were called, his, his family was called the blacksmith, is one of his forefathers used to sit in front of the blacksmith's shop. And uh, so they became known as, and there was another scholar, whose, his name was Ahmad, and there was another scholar who was also known by the name of Ahmad. And they were both became very famous as scholars and teachers and so one was distinguished from the other, the one that sits in front of the blacksmith's shop, Al-Haddad. But they say of Imam Al-Haddad that while his name, that's the origin of, the, of his name, Al-Haddad, but uh, he himself was a blacksmith of hearts. And his books and his writings are a testimony to that. And any person who reads and uh, studies the books of Imam Al-Haddad finds in them a certain barakah, that when one reads the books, well, the books that were his books that were compiled by him, you find a desire to to do good and a desire to increase in one's ibadah. All it needs is for one to read the, those books, and this is the result of the intentions of those great scholars who compiled those books. They compiled them with great intentions and great sincerity, and therefore the ummah continues to benefit from their writings generations on. Otherwise, there were many, many books in the Islamic library, many, many books that were written on similar subjects, but the difference is the, the, in the intention of the author and the sincerity of that author. And likewise, you find two people who put in the same effort in doing the same outward action in terms of inviting people and teaching people, but one has a greater effect than the other. And the statement is true of Imam Malik ibn Anas, uh, the, 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 um, the founder of the madhab that is attributed to him, Imam uh, Madhab al-Maliki when he wrote his book al-Mutta, the same Mutta that we just mentioned earlier when he wrote his book al-Mutta there were many other scholars in his time who wrote books that were similar in, uh, in, in nature and type to the Mutta of Imam Malik in that a book of hadith and with it, with it some commentary of fiqh there were a number of scholars in his time who wrote books the sim similar in style to his book and with the same name as well. So one of his students said to him, why do you write a muatta when others have written books like this? Why are you putting so much effort into this? Uh, as though to say that it is futile considering so many others have done that same thing. So he said one statement, he said, what is for Allah remains. What is for Allah remains, that's all he said. And the only book that remains is the Mu'atta of Imam Malik. And the rest of the books, we only know of them because of this incident. That there were other books that were written that were similar to the Mu'atta of Imam Malik. So this is the Barakah and the people benefit from that book from then until today. 
over a thousand years and people are benefiting from that book. And all of that reward goes back to Imam Malik ibn Anas. And likewise, the books of Imam al-Haddad, not only his books, but also in his awrad that he compiled. And Imam al-Haddad's awrad a media compilation of the awrad of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was very strict in this regard, in his adherence to the sunnah. In his adherence to the sunnah. He stuck to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in everything. And in his compilations, in his awrad, what he did was he compiled the awrad that were narrated in the books of the sunnah. And he organized them in a way for, that was accessible to the people. And uh, one of the famous awrad that is very well known in many parts of the world is known as Ratib al-Haddad. And the Ratib of Imam al-Haddad is read all over the world. Some place, places they read it and they don't even know who is the author. Particularly in South Africa and in, in Cape Town when the Cape Malays were taken from, uh, from the Malay archipelago as prisoners uh, by the colonialists, the Dutch colonialists, to South Africa, to Cape Town. They prohibited them, so I'm told by some uh, elderly South African brothers, that they, they, are, they were told by their, by their parents that when they were first brought out, they were prohibited from salah, prohibited from any form of ibadah in congregation. So what they would do was they would sing Ratib al-Haddad. And this was the word, they knew this word. And when the colonials would ask them, what is this? They say, these are traditional songs. <laughs> it was Ratib al-Haddad and they continued. Until now in South Africa, they know that they, I think they call it al-Khadat. They have weekly gatherings where they gather and they recite. And it's a compilation of the ahadith of the, of, of the awrad that were mentioned by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in it is great barakah. The other very famous one is Al-Wurd Al-Latif, that uh, to be uh, the adhkar of the morning and the evening. Um, recently also translated to English. Also a very uh, great compilation. And he, he summarized that it takes about 10 minutes to read. Those adhkar from the sunnah uh, that he compiled in that, in that order and manner. It takes no more than 10 minutes to read. But it was a summary of his own word, which took about an hour to read. He said, I simplified this for the, for the commoners. And nowadays, most commoners find that difficult to read as well. <laughs> uh, now, Imam al-Haddad's writings are definitely of great, uh, of great effect and influence. And uh, as we said, any person who reads them finds himself a desire to improve, and a desire to ascend, and a desire to draw nearer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is the barakah of those writings and the barakah of the intentions of this uh, great Imam. This was his poem that he wrote, a 49, a 49 verse poem, and it was a poem that he liked himself a lot, and he would ask for it to be uh, recited to him often, because it's very concise and it brings about all of this, the, the steps, as we will see, inshallah, as we go through the poem together. Um, and he called it the advice, he called it the wasiyah, and uh, it starts with الوصيتي لك يا ذا الفضل والأدبي My advice to you, O virtuous and well-mannered one. And so in our reading with this wasiyah, we intend, inshallah, that we are included amongst those who give advice and receive advice for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and are thereby of the successful ones. Those uh, whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran wal Asr, in the Insana la fi khusr, illa ladina aman wa amidu sadihati wa tawasaw bil haqi wa tawasaw bil sabr. That uh, by time all people are in loss except those who believe, do righteous deeds, wa tawasaw bil haqi wa tawasaw bil sabr. And they advise one another. And the word here means that they give advice and receive advice. So we hope that we are included in those who receive the advice of the Imam. And uh, in receiving the advice, we intend to apply the advice and to, uh, uh, and to spread the advice uh, of the Imam, insha'Allah ta'ala. Uh, Habib Ahmad bin Zain Habshi was born in the year 1069 Hijri. In the year 1069 uh, Hijri. Also uh, known from a young age for his um, inclination towards uh, towards ibadah and towards 
drawing nearer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he had a very strong desire for seeking knowledge. He was actually born in a town a um, uh, little bit not so close from Tarim, more than 100 kilometers away from Tarim. Um, nowadays it doesn't sound very far, but in those days it was very far, further than anywhere you can go by a plane from Australia. A hundred kilometers means a three-day journey. No. But he had a very strong desire uh, to study and to seek knowledge. So he studied under his, his father and he studied under uh, other scholars uh, as well in his town. But that did not uh, suffice him and he began to travel to Tarim and study from Tarim, uh, uh, from the scholars of Tarim. And amongst them was Imam al-Haddad whom he first started to read and study under at the age of 23 or 24, around about that age. And he continued to study under Imam Haddad until Imam Haddad passed away. In fact, he was reading the Muatta when Imam Haddad passed away. And his own age at the time was 63. Imam Haddad's age was 82. So he sought studies, he continued to study knowledge from the age of 24 until 63. He's seeking knowledge, reading. And Imam Haddad says of his student, Ahmad bin Al-Habib Ahmad bin Zain, he said of him, that Imam Ahmad bin Zain only reads for the sake of barakah, as for the knowledge he already knows it. That's what he said of his student. But look at the adab, and the adab, uh, and the and the, the the respect that they had for their scholars. And Habib Ahmad bin Zain was known, uh, as we said here, for his desire for seeking knowledge from a very uh, young age, and he would at times, uh, his students would say of him that he would become very very down, I'm looking for another word of qab, they call it in Arabic. The person becomes a little bit um, not very open, uh, constricted or constrained. Reserved. Sorry? Reserved. Reserved, yeah. Uh, but then when they start discussing masail of knowledge, then he opens up. And he opens up and he continues. And uh, it becomes his, his, his life and his, uh, his spirit suddenly livens. Uh, so it narrated of him that once a scholar came to visit him and they began to talk after Aisha in Masail of knowledge. And they continued to talk until Fajr came. Not noticing that the time of Fajr had come in. <laughs> because it was Masail of Deen uh, and, masa and matters of knowledge. And he was a man of, uh, as we said, of, of great knowledge and uh, a strong desire to seek knowledge, but also uh, a man of, um, of great charity. And he built in his time about 17 masajid in various parts. And all of those masajid still tend to stand today, in which there is five time jama'ah until today. Uh, Imam Hayy Ahmad Muzain uh, continued to teach after his father, after his sheikh passed away. Imam al-Haddad and he continued the res with the responsibility of conveying the da'wah and many of the students of Imam al-Haddad after he passed away would go to Habib Ahmad bin Zain to uh, study under him and to learn uh, from him uh, and so he passed away in the year 1144 Hijri in the year 1144 Hijri Habib Ahmad bin Zain al-Habshi uh, and, and the word Habshi comes from one of his grandfathers who used to visit uh, Ethiopia a lot and so that title stuck to him, Al-Habshi. Hayyub Ahmed Muzay Al-Habshi. Tayyib, inshaAllah. We, uh, inshaAllah, we'll read a little bit of the introduction of Hayyub Ahmed Muzay for the poem. Bidhi uh, next week we'll have a translation of the poem available uh, to the brothers and to the sisters, inshaAllah. Uh, that they can that they can follow, follow. Uh, the book itself has not been translated into English so we'll be going through his explanation inshallah uh, Habib Ahmed and Zain's explanation he says all praises to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a praise that uh, that corresponds to his uh, to his blessings and he continues uh, to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for dua testimony of faith and sending blessings and praise upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wa Sahbihi Wa Sallam Then he goes on to mention um, uh, some of the virtues uh, of his teacher Imam Abdullah bin Alawi al-Haddad 
of which Al Habib Ahmed bin Zayn al Habshi was known to be extremely attached to his teacher. And he had a, a, a great deal of respect uh, for his teacher. And he says of him that we hope that, um, uh, that he is included in, um, uh, sorry, he says rather that it is true. Uh, it, truly, it truly applies to him, to Imam Haddad, what his grandfather, the Prophet wasallam, said, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends at the head of every, um, at the head of every hundred years, uh, someone to revive the affairs of the Ummah once again. And also the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, that the ulama of my Ummah, the ulama of my Ummah, are like the prophets of Bani Israel and uh, and uh, he says that in every generation of my ummah there are the upright uh, members of my family who uh, who preserve this deen and who repel away from this deen any misconceptions that may have developed or um, or um, or deviations that people may have um, uh, created around the deen, and so here in 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 these in these uh, hadith that he mentions now now in the first hadith that we mentioned this is narrated by Abu Dawood and in, in uh, Al Hakim in his Mustadrak, the known hadith that uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala at every hundred years Allah Subhanahu wa Taala sends a person. Uh, that revives the affairs of the Ummah uh, and uh, some of the scholars of the Ummah there is agreement about as being revivers of the Deen and uh, some revivers were regional and some were universal and many of the scholars, the students of Imam Haddad and others have uh, identified Imam Haddad as being the reviver of the 12th century uh, Hijri Allah Ta'ala A'la Wa'alam, uh, another whom they mention is the likes of Imam Nawawi and Imam Abu Hamid Al Ghazali. Uh, these are all uh, considered to be revivers of the Deen by many uh, of the scholars. And some scholars have compiled booklets about the revivers of the Deen over the generations. Uh, the Hadith, the second Hadith uh, that was mentioned, that the scholars of my Ummah are like the prophets of Bani Israel, Ulama Ummati Ka Ibani. Israel. This hadith is uh, Imam Suti considered it to be uh, an authenticated hadith and he said that uh, while this hadith individually may not be authenticated however with other shawahid, with other hadith that are narrated the meaning of the hadith is correct. Uh, that was uh, what Imam Suti said in his book Kashf al-Khafa and uh, this, in, in this uh, hadith there is an incident that, uh, that the scholars generally mention when they mention this hadith about Imam Ghazali. And the story uh, is narrated um, uh, that Imam Abu Hassan al Shadili saw in his dream. Um, he saw in his dream that the Prophet وسلم, was in Bayt al Maqdis. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect Bayt al Maqdis, preserve it. And uh, allow us to see the day when it becomes free once again. When in Bayt al-Maqdis, Imam Abu al-Hassan al-Shadi, in his dream, he sees the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and with him is Sayyidina Musa and Sayyidina Isa. And Musa alayhi salam says to the Prophet sallallahu he says, you said that the scholars of your ummah, the scholars of your ummah are like the prophets of Bani Israel. Can you show me one of these scholars? So the Prophet ﷺ calls for Abu Hamid al-Ghazali. So Imam al-Ghazali comes and he sits in the presence of the Prophet ﷺ. And Musa السلام, asks him, asks Abu Imam al-Ghazali, he says, what is your name? He says, my name is Muhammad ibn Muhammad ibn Muhammad ibn Muhammad al-Ghazali. He says to him, Musa السلام, says to the Imam al-Ghazali, he says, I asked you about your name. I didn't ask you about your father's name, your grandfather's name, and your great-grandfather's name. Why are you giving me all of their names? Uh, so Imam Ghazali says to the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Ya Rasulullah, should I, should I answer 
the one who spoke to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or should I remain quiet out of adab? Well, the Prophet said to him, no, I reply, respond. So uh, Imam Ghazali says to Musa alayhi salam, he says, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked you, what is that in your right hand, O Musa? Ma tilka bi yaminika ya Musa? Your response was, قَالَ هِيَ عَصَايَ أَتَوَكَّأُ عَلَيْهَا وَأَهُشُّ بِهَا عَلَى غَنَمِ وَلِيَ فِيهَا مَآرِبُ أُخْرَى He said, this is my stick. I lean on it. أَتَكُّ عَلَيْهَا وَأَهُشُّ بِهَا عَلَى غَنَمِ And I use it as a, as a stick to herd my sheep. And I have other uses for it as well. <laughs> this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks you about what was in your hand. Why did you say that it was a stick that I lean on and I use it to herd my, to herd my, uh, to herd my flock? and so on and so forth. So Musa السلام, then said to the Prophet ﷺ, he said, yes, you are right. The scholars <laughs> of the Ummah are like the prophets of the Islam. And the Prophet ﷺ said to Musa السلام, and Isa ﷺ, I, amongst your Ummah, are there any scholars like, like, uh, like him? Are there any scholars like uh, Imam al-Ghazali? Allah Ta'ala A'la. But there is also another meaning that is contained in this hadith and that is that the ulama of this ummah are bearers of the message of the Prophet They are bearers of the inheritance of the Prophet And it is the meaning of the other hadith that he mentioned that in every generation of the ummah, the upright, the trustworthy carry this gene onto the following generation. Which brings us to the point of Isnad and the importance of Isnad in the deen. And Imam Muslim in the beginning of his book mentions two traditions, one of uh, Abdullah ibn Mubarak and the other of Ibn Sirin. When he says, um, Ibn Sirin says that Had it not be for Isnad in deen, had it not be for this tradition of Sanad in the deen, then every person could claim and say whatever he wanted. And then he say, he quotes the statement of Ima, uh, Abdullah ibn Mubarak, who says that uh, that this this knowledge is deen. This knowledge is deen. It is your relationship between your Lord. This ilm that you are seeking, this is your relationship between your Lord. So look carefully whom you take your deen from. Because this knowledge is your deen. So be careful as to who you take your knowledge from. Again, alluding to the importance of Isnad in this deen, in this ummah. And the tradition of Isnad was alive and still remains alive. And it will continue until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills for there to remain no Muslim on the face of the earth when the Quran will be lifted and the breeze blows and there remains no Muslim on the face of, on the, face of the earth. Nobody who says Allah, Allah. But until then, the Isnad remains in the Ummah. And the ones who carry on this tradition of Isnad, who connect to this golden chain of transmission that maintains for the Ummah its purity of source, uh, are those trustworthy and upright scholars of the Ummah in every generation. The ulama who are both uh, in, inwardly and outwardly purified uh, in their knowledge that they have acquired and in their character and sincerity uh, as well. Now, so this, this isnad in the deen is absolutely uh, necessary uh, for every generation to be connected to that isnad and to that tradition. And you will look throughout the ummah, wherever you go, with every part of the world you go to, there is nobody who comes and picks up a book uh, traditionally, who would pick up a book and claim to be a scholar. They, they regarded this as something of very, very weighty and very, uh, very burdensome, even though he may understand Arabic and even though he may under be able to read. But never would he claim scholarship unless he had studied under at the feet of great scholars who had themselves studied under scholars, who had themselves studied under scholars, who had themselves studied under the scholars until they reached the generation of the Tabi'een from the Sahaba, from the Prophet and the Prophet وسلم, from Jibreel وسلم, from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. That's the chain. That's the chain of transmission, where a person can say that this is what Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala requires of me, and this is what Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala has prohibited me from doing. And uh, so, being connected to that isnad and looking into the chains of transmission is absolutely essential. Uh, for the proper understanding 
of, uh, of the deen. And without the isnad in this deen, then as Imam Muhammad ibn Sirin said, any person can claim whatever he wants to claim. Any person then become, comes to the Qur'an and begins to interpret the Qur'an according to his own whims and desires uh, without this tradition of Isnad. In whatever his desire require, wants of him, whatever the political situation requires of him, whatever his hawa wants of him, he interprets the Qur'an accordingly taking the Qur'an completely, taking the Sunnah completely out of context. There is an example of this, it's a little bit extreme, but it's an example of, of how distortions can happen. Uh, this was told to me by students of knowledge when, uh, when we were studying in, in, in Pakistan, who went to an outlying village on the coast in, uh, in, in Pakistan. Uh, and they said that they got to the village, uh, into the masjid, to perform the salah. And there was a group of people at the back of the masjid who weren't performing jama'ah. But when the jama'ah goes in ruku'ah, they come and they join the salah, the jama'ah in ruku'ah, and then they go back and sit at the back of the masjid. <laughs> What's going on here? After salah, they went up to this to this group of uh, to this uh, to these few people. They said, "What are you doing? You know, what's this?" He said, Allah says in the Qur'an, وَرْكَعُوا مَعَ الرَّاكِعِينَ Our teacher said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an that perform ruku' with those who perform ruku' <laughs> So we do ruku' with those who do ruku' That's what the Qur'an says. Uh, it's an extreme example. Uh, but more, uh, more um, subtle examples of this are, 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 are common and prevalent. And our deen is our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the understandings of this deen are, and are taken from this chain of isnad and any person who introduces something we say to him where is your where is your chain of transmission in that claim that you make if it's your own understanding then it remains your own understanding but don't claim it is Islam don't speak on behalf of Islam don't claim that this is the deen say that it is your understanding it's your understanding, that's your understanding. It contradicts the understanding of the scholars of the Ummah, and that remains your understanding. For whatever it's worth. Naam. So this importance of the Isnad in the Ummah, it remains alive till today. It remains alive till today. Although less common than it used to be. Traditionally, the Ummah had an attachment to its scholars and the importance of scholars and the importance of scholarship and the importance of Isnad in the Ummah was much stronger than what it is today. Nowadays, the emphasis has become greater and more stronger on, on sheets of paper upon which certificates are printed that are given by universities who have no chain of transmission back to the Prophet a doctorate and a PhD and a master's all have their position and and and, uh, and uh, we're talking about here about knowledge of Sharia, I'm not talking about medicine or engineering or or law or any other field. I'm talking about the Sharia, the emphasis in the Sharia is not on a certificate that is given by a, a uh, by by Oxford or Cambridge or University of Sydney. That is not worth much in the eyes of Sharia. In fact, it is not worth anything unless it is substantiated with Isnad. Because Isnad is the basis of our deen. That is the source of our deen. And, um, not what a university professor uh, seeks to make us understand our deen tells us. Now, uh, he, Imam Ahmad bin Zain al-Habshi rahimahullah ta'ala, while he was very uh, this, these ahadith that he mentions, he mentions them about his teacher. But in his respect for his teacher, uh, he also learned to respect not only his teacher, but the scholars of the Ummah at large. And it is important to know that the teacher, uh, the, the respect for the, that Imam Haddad had for his teacher did not blind him from the greatness of the other scholars of the Ummah and did not restrict him in benefiting from the other scholars of the Ummah. Uh, he, he mentions this in the following, uh, following uh, pages about his teacher, uh, Imam Haddad, who took 
from more than a hundred scholars were his teachers, including scholars from the Haramain, from and and from Hadramaut, and any other scholar that he was able to correspond with uh, in writing, he did. He's corresponded with them and benefited from all of the scholars that he could benefit from. And this was also true of Habib Ahmad bin Zain al Habshi. While he had great respect for his teacher and, and reverence for his teacher and love for his teacher, he also, at, as a result of that respect for his own teacher, he learned to respect all of the other scholars of the Ummah. And this is the, the, with the Prophet وسلم, and the companions who loved the Prophet وسلم, to the degree that Abu Sufyan says, I have seen, oh, no, not Abu Sufyan. Uh, I forget his name, Subh al Hudaybiyah, the Mushrik comes from Mecca to, to uh, Suhail ibn Amr. He, see, he, comes, he comes to, uh, to write, uh, to come to an agreement uh, with the Prophet and he goes back to his people and he says, I've seen the people um, all over the world, may not have even been Suhail ibn Amr, I take that back. Might have been uh, another, another of the Mushrikin, I forget his name. He came, he, when he went back to his people, he said, I have been to the kings of Persia in their, ki in, in their palaces, to the kings of the Romans in their palaces, to the kings of Abyssinia in their palaces. But I have not seen a people revere anyone like the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Revere and respect Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Such was their respect. But they learned from that respect for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the respect for the other prophets. Before their love for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they knew no love for any other prophets. But after loving the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and respecting the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to that degree, they learned from that respect to respect all of the other prophets of the Ummah. And the Prophet وسلم, taught his companions this, to respect all of the Ummah. Any person in whose heart there is La ilaha illallah is worthy of respect. Not only that, but he told Sayyidina Umar and Sayyidina Ali uh, Both of them, that when you leave, there is a man from, from Qaran, Uwais al-Qarani, and he, and he described them for him, that he described him to them. And then he said to, he said to them, if you meet him, then ask him to make istighfar for you. What is, what is Uwais al-Qarani compared to the istighfar of the Prophet And the Prophet did dua for them and did istighfar for them. He taught them that it's not a matter of the Prophet the best of the best did dua for me. He did istighfar for me. Khalas, it's enough. I don't need the istighfar on anyone else. And that's the reality. The istighfar of the Prophet for Sayyidina, Abu Bakr, for Sayyidina Umar and Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhuma is greater then the istighfar of Sayyidina Uwais uh, uh, al-Qarani uh, without, without yani, any doubt. But even then the Prophet ﷺ teaches them that, that adab, that sublime adab with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says to them that when you meet him, ask him to make istighfar for you. Now who is better, the companion of the Prophet ﷺ or Sayyidina Uwais al-Qarani? Without that, the companions of the Prophet But even then, the Prophet teaches them, Sayyidina Ali and Sayyidina Umar the greatest of the companions of the Prophet who fought with him all of those expeditions. And they are who they are. He tells them to make it as istighfar. Even more than this, the Prophet when Sayyidina Umar asked him permission to go for Umrah, he said, do not forget me in your dua, my brother. Prophet Sallallahu is telling Umar radiallahu Umar radiallahu anhu was spent years in kufr and shirk worshipping idols. He spent years worshipping other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He came out with a poisoned sword to kill the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then he accepts Islam. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself is telling him, do not forget me in your duas, O Umar. This humbleness for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the state of true, true ubudiyah, true servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that constant state of humbleness in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and never to undermine, never to belittle the state and position and rank of every Muslim. This Imam Ahmad bin Zain Hajj himself, towards the end of his life, he lost his eyesight. He lost his eyesight. Uh, and he, uh, he had a guide who would take him through the streets to uh, a particular place. And on his way, on one particular day, they got to their destination very quickly. 
So Imam Ahmed Muzain asked the guide, he said to him, we got to our destination quicker than usual today. Usually, you know, it takes us a lot longer and we meet a lot more people along the way. He said, yes, Imam, I took you around today, uh, the, back, the back way, so that the people don't gather around you and trouble you and disturb you. So he was saying that I had mercy towards you felt compassion towards you and what did you it took you away from the from the people he said to him that do you know that every one of those people whom we meet and we greet it it is us seeking that Allah subhanahu uh, blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a result of us meeting them from them we seek that blessing for we, so next time take us with in front of those people because we want to meet them we want to interact with them in the hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will show us mercy because of them. So this was the, this was the, the state uh, of the pious and the righteous of the Ummah. And we have amongst us today two extremes of people. One is an extreme of do not show respect to anyone. It is you and your understandings. You have the books in front of you, Google and Yahoo and whatever else. And you have your own brain in your own mind do it all yourself nobody is worthy of any respect one extreme and on the other extreme my sheikh my teacher and everyone else is not worthy and not worthy of anything and both of them are extremes that are reprehensible and rejected in the sharia and the balance is always within the middle and the respect that one has for his teacher or for his sheikh does not diminish the respect that he has for other shuyu and for other and for other uh, teachers uh, as well. Wallahu ta'ala a'la wa a'lam. Inshallah next week we will start um, we will start in the wasiyah itself. Uh, he, before, before we conclude, Imam Ahmad bin Zain also says that he, when in his writing, his explanation on the wasiyah, he started off with um, he started off uh, writing uh, on the, uh, an explanation. He says, I'm not worthy of writing this uh, explanation on the, on the words and the works of the likes of Imam al-Haddad. And how can I elaborate on their intentions when their intentions are beyond our own uh, comprehend, comprehension and the meanings that they, uh, that, and the knowledge behind each one of those verses of poetry that he wrote. But then he said that part of, part of acting upon knowledge is to disseminate that knowledge. And in that barakah, and, uh, uh, we, 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 in, we, we write and we compile. And our work is, he says, that is merely to gather and to collect. And most of his explanation on the wasiyah, he says, was based on the writings of Imam Haddad himself and the writings of Imam Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, amongst other many other books, but predominantly are uh, those to um, the writings of both uh, of those great yeah, imams. And then he says, um, uh, and then he says uh, that he wrote. He began wrote, writing his explanation after he saw the importance that Imam Haddad had uh, gave to the to the poem itself, and um, and other scholars and the, the importance they gave to it. He, intent, he began to write the explanation and then he sent um, a copy of, of it to Imam Haddad, the beginning of his explanation on the wasiyah, and Imam Haddad liked it. And he gave him permission to continue his explanation. And he gave him the title of the book, Al Mawarid al Rawi al Haniya, Fi Sharhi al Abwa al Abiyat al Manduma al Wasiyah. And we see here again that, that, uh, that spirit of humbleness. And, uh, and a sense of, um, of worthlessness in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Despite being a great scholar in his own right, Imam Ahmad bin Zain al-Habshi, he still considers himself being beneath the rank uh, of uh, uh, or worthiness of writing a book or compiling a book about tarbiyah and suluk. And he says that the person who, um, those scholars who wrote when they wrote, they acted upon their knowledge. But we write without action. So how then can we write? These are these, the likes of these Imams. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to benefit uh, from their knowledge, to benefit from their adab, and to benefit uh, from their etiquettes. Allah ta'ala a'la wa a'lam. Subhanallah wa bihamdi, subhanakallah wa bihamdi, ka nashiru wa la ilaha illa anta nasafiru kuna tubi. Subhanallah wa bihamdi, 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 wa bihamdi,